All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to talk about GitOps in action now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Anil. I'm Billy. Hey, Nathan Kalra. Hey. So we are from Broadcom, and uh, you know we are here for a case study on uh, GitOps in action in Broadcom. So you know, we'll start. So uh, for intro, like, uh, you know, what is Broadcom software? You know, what does, uh, you know, SaaS platform engineering do? And, uh, you know, GitOps, uh, how do we use GitOps for our advantage? So this is our basically agenda for today, right? And we'll go into details there. So for the intro, right, um, you know, Broadcom is a large, you know, uh, enterprise company, which was primarily into the software, you know, into the semiconductor market, right? So anything that you do on, you know, on online, that wherever you connect today, the more the then chances are every, you know, the, the stuff or the, you know, your data is translating somewhere, it's touching Broadcom technology, right? So we have um, all the kind of uh, semiconductor, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, tips into whether it's a, you know, cell phones or data centers or connectivity, anything which is out there. But then, you know, uh, the company uh, is about, uh, you know, uh, as of last financial year was about 24 billion in revenue and we invest about $5 billion in our R&D. And then uh, we transitioned from basically a semiconductor, primarily semiconductor company to a software company as well. So we diversified in there with the, acquisition of CA technologies and semantic and that's where Broadcom software came in. So you can see our legacy like how we came in uh, and then how the Broadcom software came in with the, uh, you know, CA and uh, semantic. So in, in, in the software arena, Broadcom software, right, we are, you know, as of last financially again, you know, we are five billion dollar plus in revenue and uh, we invest almost like 15 percent of our revenue into R&D, which is, you know, again in, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, which may be even larger than some of the company's total revenue itself, right? And uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, yeah, thousands of patents and, uh, you know, almost 80% uh, of our workforce is into the R&D. So, in terms of our usage, almost uh, 10 of a 10 global companies use us. So we have, um, you know, uh, SaaS software that is used by a lot of companies. So we have infrastructure specific SaaS softwares or security based SaaS softwares with the different portfolios. So these are like, you know, you see there are AIOps, DevOps, and, uh, you know, network, you know, security and identity software. These are like software product portfolios which are sold as a SaaS service. So, you know, these products again, you know, portfolios have multiple products in there. And these are all revenue based, uh, you know, subscription revenue based uh, SaaS model. So within uh, Broadcom software, uh, we represent uh, SaaS platform engineering. So what we do is basically all these SaaS software that we sell, right, for subscription uh, online, right, these are basically all run in a standard platform. So we came in from, you know, CA technologies and then with semantic acquisition, you know, uh, our platform engineering got expanded. So we um, had these uh, softwares, you know, which were running in, you know, in the, at some point in bay metal data centers, and then we moved on to VM based hosting and as technology progressed, right? Then on to, we started our, a shift to containers, um, you know, years back, right? So you can reference our previous, um, you know, presentations in the OpenShift Commons in 2017 and 19. So we have been heavy uh, focused on, um, on containerization. And, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, what we provide within Broadcom is, right, because there are so many software, you know, products and software portfolios for SaaS delivery, right? So we create a common platform so that all the teams, all the products which are delivered, you know, are delivering these services online, they utilize the standards, you know, based platform. And these, you know, for that we have, um, you know, our uh, standard CD pipelines for you know, spinning up infrastructure, or whether it's a network or other resources, you know, containerized and non-containerized workloads and uh, 
multiple application components that we create ourselves or we use, you know, where, you know, uh, cloud provides the native strength, we utilize those, but we still maintain, you know, security and standards because these environments for us, right, you know, can vary based on the, you know, compliance and security requirements, right? Something maybe for FedRAMP, something maybe for, you know, payment security based, you know, highly sensitive stuff, right? So in the in SaaS world, right, for customer data and customer privacy is supreme. So there are multiple, you know, audits and, you know, uh, things will go on. So we try to address those as a standard platform and then, you know, um, our teams will utilize that. So, you know, this is our uh, basically a technology stack. You know, you might have seen, uh, you know, all these icons as people had seen, right? There are like a lot of icons out there. So we, you know, set up our own services, plus we use some of, you know, we can't build everything on our own. So we have to use, you know, some of the components and try to, but still we maintain the standards and how we gonna roll that out as a, so that multiple products can use it rather than everyone trying to reinvent the wheel, right? So we, if there is one team which needs something, there is more than more chance that, hey, there are other product teams which will also need it, right? So we try to create a standard and that prevents, you know, reinvention of the wheels, multiple people trying to do the same thing and then we have to clobber the solution, right? So instead of that, we look at like, okay, what is the, some team needs it, we collaborate and maybe they can, we are a first beta customer internally, right? And then, because all these products are again multi-tenant from their perspective, right? So what we treat is internally within Broadcom platform engineering team, we treat our product team as our customer. So they are, for us, it's a tenant, right, in our platform, but that tenant can be again a multi-tenant uh, platform which is out there. So uh, that's how, uh, you know, uh, we, we work out in that. So. Yeah, so the, this is gonna um, kind of simplify or repeat what, uh, what Anil was describing. From a, a product team, all the products that we support within Broadcom, this is what they get to see. They just need to focus on their continuous delivery pipeline. They, they describe how their application's going to be deployed and it, it goes into a SaaS platform. It has all those different pieces. This is just very simplified for what we're doing. Um, so yeah. Uh, but we're doing this for all these different product teams within Broadcom. Um, 30 different product teams. Some of them have different sub teams. Lots of different developers on these teams. A um, whole bunch of different CD pipelines. Um, checked with uh, one of our team, like over 7,000 regular jobs running on average per day. Um, so it's just a lot of stuff going on, um, and we need to do that as efficiently as possible. You know, make this thing go very fish, efficient. Um, and so some of the ways that we do that is um, using common platform foundation, make sure that the environments are as similar as possible across a whole bunch of different clusters and environments, um, using reusable modules so that we can pick and choose because, yes, the truth is not all environments are going to be same. Production's probably going to be bigger than your dev or verify environment. Um, enabling as much self-service automation as we can, um, but we have to do that with guardrails. We can't give developers access to, to do everything in production. Um, and then collaborating with the different product teams, um, things like using inner source so that if we're building a particular cluster and a team needs needs to scale a node pool. They can submit a pull request and actually get that change in, or maybe they want a, a new dedicated node pool for a, a component, so. So here's kind of a, a diagram of some of the different components. We have a common VPC networking layer that connects various components. Um, depending on the environment, it may have an OpenShift cluster, it may have database virtual machines, it may have a GKA cluster. Um, and there could be even like product specific workloads, things like a bucket or service accounts or, or some, um, you know, not everything is containerized. As much as we want that containerized, sometimes uh, different product teams need to have a VM of their own. So, um, but through the, the continuous delivery pipeline that we provide teams, they can describe their application via Helm and get it deployed either to an OpenShift cluster or a GKA cluster. Um, but one of the things that we found is sometimes they need to deploy infrastructure. So we gave them the, the capability of 
writing Terraform, putting that into the pipeline, and so they can actually deploy their infrastructure within that, that product-specific project and area um, to, to give them whatever either cloud-native resources or VMs or, or stuff that they need from their perspective. So that was from the product teams. Um, what about our team? Like, all of this infrastructure needs to be created. We don't go through and like manually create it. We wouldn't be able to scale that way. So each of these components is built using a, a set of automation that's packaged as an automation so that, you know, if we need to build an OpenShift cluster, we've got automation that can build that. We can specify how many, you know, nodes or, you know, stuff we need. If we need to build database machines or a GKA cluster, like each one, you know, sometimes we can have one tool that'll do multiple things. Sometimes we have to have specific tools um, specifically for something like a, a core networking. And those tools are, are built and run in, in the same pipeline method. So we, we have an um, infrastructure as code configuration repo. So in our pipelines, we, we define, okay, this is what we want that particular SaaS platform component to look like. And, um, and it will go through a Docker base or a Docker packaged container and will actually build that SaaS piece. And then that tool is actually built using, you know, a same, you know, the same CI type pipeline that you would see. So it'll package, you know, either Ansible or Terraform or various tools that we're using as part of building the infrastructure. And then that then is used within the pipeline to, to build that. Now, one of the things you may notice is we're actually, we, we've given product teams the ability to deploy to clusters and deploy their own infrastructure, um, but we actually manage database um, virtual machines, and that was one area that was, that was missing in this pipeline. Um, teams would have to, to create a ticket and request a database, and get, it was a very manual process. So I'm gonna hand it off to Nitin that's gonna describe how we, we solve that. Right, uh, so if you look at the Kubernetes adoption phases uh, throughout the journey of you know, how exactly uh, uh, from, from a manifest point of view, how exactly it kind of you know, evolved. So we basically started with stateless applications, uh, mainly backed up by replica sets, deployments. This was like you know more than uh, more than half a decade back. Uh, packaging mechanisms uh, were like YAML, JSON, manifest, Helm, of course, you know coming into the picture. Then comes in the stateful applications. This is where you know the database applications or any any of these, let's say a Redis cluster or MongoDB clusters, anything around. Uh, those were backed up by uh, persistent volume claims with you know uh, uh, CSI drivers coming in uh, with the new formation of the, uh, of the whole Kubernetes part. New packaging mechanism also kind of you know were adopted something like customize for example. Then comes in autopilot applications, ACA operators. So uh, with operators brings in you know uh, a lot of rich features such as like auto backups, app sensitive scaling, seamless upgrades. Uh, uh, if you look at the packaging mechanism for the operators, again, uh, going back to the same old YAMLs, but alongside, you know, with OLM bundles, uh, which, which was a new thing altogether. So within Broadcom, uh, these are some of the SaaS provided uh, operators that, that, we, that we actually support and have. And if you look at the whole breadth of it, uh, we, we, base, we, we have starting from the database to pups up to uh, security, something like a vault, uh, you know, a service mesh, Istio, all of these as like uh, uh, within the platform that goes in into any of our clusters, whatever we have uh, for the engineering teams to basically uh, consume and, you know, de uh, de uh, deliver it or deploy it, what uh, Billy was stating, you know, we, we are the exact same pipeline. So the approach over here is how do we, how do we basically take in uh, the same operator uh, method and use the same GitOps approach to deploy, you know, even if it is an operator or anything of that sort. So, uh, for specifically for operators, uh, we we finalize and cho uh, chose OLM as like to uh, to do the whole lifecycle management of the operators, uh, which involves not just the uh, initialization, but you know, uh, installation, upgrades, seamless upgrades, anything of that sort. Um, uh, we we introduced our own uh, uh, own catalog, OLM catalog that is, um, and we we also wrote our own OLM bundler, which you can think of it as like an operator hub.io, but internal to Broadcom within the SaaS itself. And this catalog specifically has those specific operators, those certified specific operators which are scanned 
and been delivered uh, you know, uh, through, uh, through the same GitOps approach uh, to do any of the deployment or upgrades. Effectively giving operand as like a service or think of it as like a cloud within a cloud wherein uh, teams can now choose any given service and you know, do, the, do the deployment and architect it uh, around that particular part. So as we were scaling, uh, here comes in, uh, uh, there was one of the slide earlier, right? Uh, 10,000 10, plus nodes and you know, hundreds of clusters. Uh, we quickly realized we, we need to scale further. We need to do HA on the, on, uh, on the, uh, on, on the cluster itself, you know, uh, uh, Kubernetes multi-cluster or uh, cluster HA. So as it gains adoption, uh, there, were, there were certain of these, these particular queries that started coming in. How do I gain geo redundancy? How, how, do, how do I observe these fleet of clusters, right, from, from, a, single, uh, uh, so from a single plane? Uh, how do I connect native Kubernetes service across the clusters? And that too, in an, uh, from an internal native to Kubernetes, not like, you know, going outside, uh, not via the ingress or anything of that sort. How do, how do we do that? Uh, how do we architect something like an edge computing? Um, a very classic example or a use case that we recently saw was uh, deploy a MongoDB cluster in US region while have the edge nodes in a Europe region, which is just read only. Uh, and you know, yes, there were latency issues uh, which we kind of you know, overcame, but how, how do we do all of that particular thing? Additionally to that, from a GitOps point of view, how exactly do we deliver the same solution across multiple clusters how, how do we, uh, you know, adhere to multiple security policies? And how do we make sure all our clusters are adhering to that and being, uh, uh, the same solution is kind of, you know, uh, being adopted by a specific cluster. There is no drifting anywhere within the cluster. How do we, how do, we do that? So uh, as a community, of course, you know, we need a solution for, the, for that particular one. Um, some of these solutions, what we identified, have implemented, and certain work in progress that is going on, uh, uh, particularly Submariner and uh, MCS, which helps us uh, joining multiple clusters to uh, have uh, internal services communicate with each other. Something like open cluster management, which is still in progress, uh, giving in, uh, you know, observability point of view, uh, uh, pushing in common manifests. There, there are cluster level operators, uh, which teams do not interact, but we, we basically, as like, uh, you know, uh, within a team or, or maintaining a SaaS platform, need to deliver. How do we do that? So open cluster management helps us around that particular area. Concept of a hub cluster uh, with multiple managed clusters coming in, joining at the hub cluster, and uh, you feed in something on the hub cluster, all of it trickles down towards you know, all of the, uh, the managed clusters. So just a pictorial diagram over here for the open cluster management. Uh, 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 on the left-hand side is the same concept that I explained, and on the right-hand side you can see uh, same security policies or any of the cluster manifests being feeded in into the same GitOps pipeline, what, uh, what uh, any of the teams are using, irrespective of whether it is for a Kubernetes manifest, deployed via Helm, customized, we don't care, or uh, infrastructure pipeline, it's exactly the same pipeline which is basically meant for, uh, for deploying it across, uh, uh, using the hub cluster and deploying it across the multiple clusters. And speaking of security policies, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Anil to speak further on. Hey, so as you we described, right? So our environment, right? Basically, as a team, we focus on um, you know the SaaS side of things. So that means the hundreds of clusters scale that you saw, right? Thousand, you know, ten thousand plus nodes. And the environments are basically you know uh, varied in you know uh, because these are used with the SaaS applications. The customers are enterprise customers, so there is a strict or stringent requirements on security, compliance, and you know regular audits and all that, right? So whether that's a you know uh, SOC audits or PCI or like FedRAMP or like you know now we are trying to go into you know like say IL-45 kind of you know so the, depending on the environment type right there are you know multiple environments that we spin up so anything that we think of these these are like building blocks so we think of okay we want to spin up one environment second environment or whatever right and how do you you know put all these standards across all these environments or cluster. One environment may consist of 10, 15 clusters all together, right? And the scale is humongous, right? So how do we uh, do that? So, uh, you know, we, you know, the DevSecOps approach there, right? Because we think of this, you know, whatever platform that we create, we think of platform 
end to end, right? Right from, you know, infrastructure layer that we spin up. So it's not like, okay, we are just thinking of pipeline only for application deployment, right? Infrastructure applications, you know, and on top of that security compliance, whatever we can put that as a standard so that the team, it's easier for teams to adopt that, right? So all the, you know, forward, you know, thinking organization would always plan for that because, you know, you can think start small, but you know, you'll realize, oh, it's basically gone beyond a scale, then it's very difficult to handle at that time, right? That's where we try to stay ahead of the curve and try to adopt. If there is one team needing, as I mentioned, right, you know, we think there's some other team which is gonna need it, right? So let's use that first team as a beta customer for us, right? So, uh, you know, uh, with the security, same approach, right? So it was not like, okay, that you build it, you run it, right? It's like, hey, if you're gonna build it, you are responsible for security too, right? So we think of shift left model all the way, right? You know, e even in the infrastructure as Billy mentioned, right? Uh, you know, whatever we provide, we shift left in that scenario, right? We will collaborate, we'll have a, you know, inner source, we'll, you know, you can, you know, do a pull request, you can look into what is being done, right? But it's a shift left here, it's a shared responsibility model for the product teams, right? They, they'll be able to adopt, right? Like, you know, operators or multi-cluster services that we provide, you can use those, but at the same time, there are standards, right? So it's not like, a, there's not enough freedom, there's freedom, but there is guardrails as well, right? So, so from, you know, security evolution perspective, right? Because as I said, right, we, our SaaS products used to run in data centers, then we moved on to the, you know, VM-based hosting and then on to the hybrid cloud, public-private cloud, and then on to uh, being cloud agnostic. So, um, you know, even security has, you know, evolved the same way, right? So we, instead of, you know, someone, some experts doing the scanning and coming out with the reports. Okay, now teams could got into the scanning, but they still, it was like, okay, application teams or security teams. So to now, you know, we have been supporting containers in real time, you know, security and compliance for all our environments, right up to the developer level, right? They can see what is going on, right? Then the security champions can also take, you know, uh, action on top of that. And security teams basically have moved into more of oversight role rather than actually you know, trying to, you know, uh, you know, implement everything, right? So we have built our, you know, uh, DevSecOps, you know, for the our entire SaaS platform ecosystem by having a multi-layered approach, right? Like, hey, where we gonna, because we, we uh, as I mentioned, right, we look end to end, then we say, okay, here is, you know, where CA processes, here is where CD processes, right? And then eventually this environment is getting deployed in production, right? So as, you know, like, hey, how operations teams would look at from the compliance perspective. Some customer is gonna look for, here is my compliance and security needs, how you are being meeting those, right? So we try to address that right, right in there. So we integrate security as well as compliance, basically both at deployment, build and deployment times, right? Like say, you know, uh, with that mindset in, you know, we, we keep that uh, as our focus, right? That, hey, this is how things are gonna get deployed. And then we try to automate, right? So, because with hundreds of clusters, if you don't do that, then, you know, you have a lot of problems, right? Then um, we offer teams, because whatever tool we adopt, right? We try to make, again, shift left scenario included in that, that, hey, teams will be able to access that and they'll be able to manage and, uh, you know, so, um, you know, to make life easier for them. So basically result for us is basically we have, uh, you know, secure environments which are with the runtime defense in depth and, uh, you know, we have granular vulnerability and security uh, compliance for, for policies enforced. So basically the, what that does is basically our dev and ops teams, you know, they can focus on more uh, strategic work than rather than, you know, mundane more repetitive work. So we look at a security at a holistic layer, you know, whether that's a, you know, uh, network policies or whether that's a, you know, you know, board security policies or whether that's a WAF policies, TLS policies or SSL policies, we push that out to the environments, right? And teams are, you know, can utilize those, test those configurations and then roll it out to production. So if it is, okay, TLS 1.3 is going to be standard, then that policy is available in all the clusters. They can just adopt to that and, you know, the policy is already pushed out. So basically uh, with that, the basics still apply, right? Because we create uh, hardened images and that's where the 
all the stuff starts, right? We have, okay, you are gonna adopt the standard images that we are putting in out there, and then we use uh, continuous uh, posture improvement, right, with the, all the kind of scans. And then uh, here are some of the best practices, right, that uh, we wanted to share with the teams. Uh, you know, we want to automate and enforce with automation so that there is less friction. People understand what is being done and they are able to, lev you know, make, you know, use of it rather than, you know, one-sided, you know, it's like, okay, collaborative. And then, um, you know, uh, along with that, right, you know, it's very easy to forget the dynamic uh, runtime scans where you look at the policies and security because the containers will come and go, right? You may not realize what has happened. So you need to be, stay on top of that, right? Like, hey, those policies prevent your, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, secure your environment during the night also, right? Like in that way, something came up, was it compliant or not, right? Take action on that one, right? if it was something which was not intended. And then uh, more importantly, right? Like there be always some new technology tools, APIs, which will deprecate and all that, right? Like, you know, it's everywhere, right? Whether that's a cloud APIs or some product APIs or even, uh, you know, even within Kubernetes, right? You have to stay on top of that. So that's our um, basically how, you know, some of the best practices we wanted to share. So with that, uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, we'll welcome any questions. Great, thank you so much.